A very good evening to one and all present here. To our honorable guest speaker, Dr. Dilip Mukherjee, Director Salla Anil Modi School of Economics, Professor Amita Vaidya, our faculty members, Professor Nahid Fatima and Professor Suranjana Jorda, and all attendees present here with us today. We heartily welcome you to the closing ceremony of the 11th edition of Cutting, our annual Economics and Management Fest, and the second edition of the Economic Justice Conclave, or EDGECON, organized by SVTM's NMIMS, Sarla Anil Modi School of Economics, Mumbai. After three days of passionate expert sessions, I now invite Bhavna Mundra to introduce our guest of honor for this evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Divija. During our conclave, we talked about everything sells capital, entrepreneurship, labor, and land, and how inequality thrives in all three of them. The third day focused on the fixed resource land. We initiated talks on disaster and crisis management, where we discussed vulnerability assessment, budgeting of relief funds, and rehabilitation of the most vulnerable. We also discussed displacement, slum rehabilitation, industrialization, land acquisitions, and integration of the displaced into the society. The last session of EDGECON 2021 is graced by our guest of honor, Dr. Dilip Mukherjee. A professor of economics, he is the director of the Institute for Economic Development at Boston University. He received his PhD from the London School of Economics in 1982 and has previously taught at Stanford University and Indian, Indian Statistical Institute. His research interests include development economics, contract, and organization theory. Most of his work on development economics focuses on Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and China on topics such as agricultural development, financial inclusion, supply chain intermediaries, entrepreneurship, and governance. Today, sir shall be talking about land inequality. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavna and Divija, for this opportunity to speak to this, uh, the economic justice conclave. It's really heartening to see so many people interested uh, on a weekend, a Sunday evening, to listen to uh, uh, talks on inequality. It just speaks to your passion in, in this, on the subject of, uh, of you know, economics, uh, and more broadly, democracy and the voice of the poor. So I, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, land inequality in India. Uh, and one second, I'm, okay, I'm still trying to figure out, okay, how to navigate the screen. Uh, so I hope you can all see my screen, uh, my slides, uh, land inequality yes, in India. Yes, okay. So let me, uh, let me begin. Why is land inequality important? Uh, well, for the most obvious reason that uh, we all care about justice and fairness and land inequality is an important component of economic inequality. And I'll, I'll be showing you lots of facts, okay, to, to, to provide uh, substance to these arguments. Uh, and in particular, there's a strong connection between inequality and poverty. Poverty, as you know, is you know about uh, a, a phenomenon where people fall below what we deem a minimally acceptable standard of living. <clears throat> and one of the most important determinants of poverty is the lack of assets, and in particular in rural areas with landlessness, the lack of ownership of agricultural land. Uh, so I'm going to also show you uh, arguments and facts of how inequality and landlessness are connected. Now, the uh, an additional reason why we should all be concerned about inequality, even if you're not concerned about the poor, if all you're concerned about is economic growth, uh, there are also good arguments that inequality has a functional impact in, in, in lowering economic growth and democracy more broadly. And there are various channels for this. High land inequality uh, reduces the access of the poor to markets uh, in, 
let's say financial markets, yeah, education and jobs and entrepreneurship. <clears throat> it increases the capture of government to the political process by landed elites. And through that mechanism, uh, reduces agricultural productivity by lowering public investments in rural infrastructure and education. <clears throat> so part of the interest of landed elites, since they rely on cheap labor, uh, they'd like to have a large pool of landless population who uh, absolutely need to, to work uh, on their farms uh, to earn a living. <clears throat> And therefore, high landlessness is associated with low wages, which is what uh, large landowners uh, would like. So they have interests to block uh, programs of public education uh, or rural infrastructure, such as roads, uh, which would lessen their control over the landless. <clears throat> and finally, when land inequality becomes truly enormous, uh, as we see in various parts of central India, you see social conflict and violence, and in fact, the government loses control. <clears throat> so these are some of the reasons uh, that, I'm sorry. These are some of the reasons why it's often been argued that uh, countries in East Asia, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and Vietnam, and as well as China, one of the reasons why they have managed to achieve a higher growth rate than other Asian countries with high inequality, such as India, Pakistan, Thailand, and Philippines. So inequality is, of course, abhorrent in and of itself, but it also has an indirect effect on the progress of the entire society through these mechanisms. So this is the re I mean, I, I'm sure you all know this. Uh, this is why we care about inequality. Uh, so I'm going to argue that, uh, well, land inequality is an important component of economic inequality. Uh, and then uh, look at some facts just to understand uh, inequality in India, the, the magnitude of the phenomenon. How does it vary? Uh, between India and other countries, other developing countries? How does it vary within India across different states? And how has it been changing over time? So that will be the first uh, topic. The second topic is how do we explain these facts? And I'm going to focus on the role of demographics, on the role of markets, land markets, and the role of government policies, particularly land reform. <coughs> And I'm going to argue uh, that land reform has been ineffective in lowering land inequality. It has had some impact, but the effect has been very small. And the question is, why has land reform been ineffective? And whether we may expect uh, somehow to, uh, for you know, land reform to become more effective in the future. I'm going to argue that that is unlikely to happen. So that's not what we can realistically expect for the future. And therefore, the last subtopic will be, well, so if we are facing the future, what can be done to deal with the problem of inequality? So these are roughly the four subtopics, uh, and I want to talk for you know a few minutes on each of them. <clears throat> Okay, so let me start with uh, some facts about land inequality. And uh, the first proviso, I'm limiting attention to inequality of agricultural land. <clears throat> uh, and that is just, you know, because I have only half an hour. Uh, I, I, you know, urban land is, is a totally different topic. And two out of three people in India live in rural areas. So I think this is uh, the first order phenomenon. And second, a warning, uh, if you look at st official statistics uh, on land inequality, don't just take them at face value. Uh, measuring land inequality is difficult. And a, a, a brief uh, enunciation of the reasons. One is the land records in India are very poor. 
because mainly because they are kept uh, uh, most of it is uh, is on paper paper records and uh, the records are kept at a plot by plot level whereas what we really care about is how much land people or households own and it is very difficult to find all the plots that any particular household owns because the records are net, not kept at an individual or household level they're kept at the plot level i've tried to construct this from official land records yeah, in in west bengal a state that i have studied intensively it's almost impossible to do from the official land records the other source which most people use are the agricultural censuses but they are based on operational holdings farm holdings and again this is at the level of the of, of the farm holding they do not aggregate uh, across plots that are being farmed by different households so again you don't get data of inequality at the personal level <clears throat> a third reason is that most statistics ignore a very important category which is the landless they focus on inequality amongst those who have some land okay but they ignore people who own no land whatsoever okay so if you if you you know if your land ownership is exactly zero you're not counted in the inequality statistics whereas you should be and finally the fourth reason is that most statistics measure the area of land that is owned whereas what really matters is the value of land because quite often it is the case that uh, wealthier people the land that they own is more valuable uh, than that owned by uh, by by less wealthy people so you have to adjust for the value of land <laughs> so for all these reasons uh, the only way to uh, obtain reliable measures of land inequality is to rely on household surveys <laughs> uh, that overcome these problems to varying degrees so what i'm going to report to you are based on household surveys and these are based on recent studies carried out by the world inequality lab uh, you're welcome to just google world inequality lab and 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 look into uh, you know the various publications uh, online uh, within india facts i'm going to uh, base on uh, household surveys either the national sample survey or my own <clears throat> so here is the first uh, table uh, this is an all India uh, survey uh, and it's here classifying households by the, uh, the, the, the size category of the land that they own. This is in hectares of land. Uh, the smallest is of course landless. This includes the landless. Anybody who is uh, effectively landless is in the first category. And then you go down and the largest category is more than 10 hectares. Uh, if you go across to the right, you look at income, household income. And the first most obvious fact is that if you compare the landless with the people who have the most land, the ratio of income is roughly 1 to 10. Okay, so this is average monthly income, 4,700 rupees for the landless, 41,400 for uh, people with more than 10 hectares. So this is the basis of the argument that land inequality is a very important component of economic inequality <clears throat> the second thing to observe is that when you look at the composition of income the landless are relying mostly on income from wages 64 percent okay and very little from cultivation one percent okay and 26 percent comes from animals farming of animals uh, whereas if you go down the more land you have wages become less important you rely less on the labor market you rely more on cultivation and the proportion on cultivation goes up from 1% to 86%. Now let's compare between South Asia and the rest of the world. And what you really should be focusing on are the green bars because the green bars incorporate both the landless, the adjustment for the landless, as well as an adjustment for the value of land. Okay, and you can see that the these adjustments make a lot of difference because the traditional statistics which ignore the value of land and which ignore the landless correspond to the red bars. And you see there's a huge difference uh, between the red bar and the, the blue bar. The blue bar adjusts for value, but not the landless and the green bar adjusts for both. So these adjustments make a huge difference. So what this graph is showing you is the proportion of land 
that is owned by the bottom half of the population. Okay, and it's 12% if you measure it in the conventional way in South Asia, but if you measure it correctly, okay, it's less than 1%. So it's less than 1% in South Asia, and the only other part of the world which has this much inequality and landlessness is Latin America. And you see in China and Vietnam, the share of the bottom is much higher. Okay, and even Africa is do much, doing much better than South Asia. What about within South Asia? Uh, so here are the three major countries in South Asia, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And this is the share of the bottom 50%. Uh, and it's roughly, you know, about 1% or less. Uh, how does it compare with China and Vietnam? China and Vietnam have 10 and 7%, much higher. Okay. And if you compare against other uh, sub-Saharan African countries, such as Malawi, Nigeria, Tanzania, even they're doing a lot better. So India is about one of the highest uh, levels of land inequality and landlessness in the world. It's close to uh, the, the truly basket cases, which are Ecuador, Guatemala, and Ethiopia. And uh, this is, uh, again, uh, a measure of landlessness in uh, South Asia, which you see 38%, comparable to Latin America, 37%. And within, within South Asia, the extent of landlessness, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, 39, 40%, about the same, much higher than in China and Vietnam. What about changes over time? Uh, that is, you know, there are relatively few studies of this because of the difficulty of carrying it out. I did uh, one such study looking at changes in inequality in rural West Bengal between the late 60s and the early 2000s. So this is a period spanning about 35 years. I'm sorry, the, the numbers here are a little small, so you may have difficulty seeing. So let me tell you the most important facts. Uh, if you look at within village uh, measures of land inequality, Gini coefficient was 0.55 in 1968, and it went up to 0.65 uh, by 2004. Same thing for the coefficient of variation went from 1.36 to 1.73. And if you look at the share of households by land category, the proportion of households that were landless was 38%. Uh, so roughly one in three households was landless in 1968. That number increased to 57%. So more than half of all rural households in the early 2000s were landless. So landlessness has increased in an, at, a, at, a, at an alarming rate. Uh, however, even at the, at the high end, when you look at the proportion of households that are large or big landowners, even that has fallen. So basically land holdings have shrunk for everybody. So here is a brief summary of what I just showed you. First, land inequality represents a substantial component of income inequality. Second, land inequality in India is among the highest in the world. Third, land inequality is associated with high landlessness and poverty. And fourth, it is rising steadily over the past 50 years. Okay, so this is a problem, a very serious problem. Uh, Divija, let me uh, pause here if there are any uh, important clarifying questions that I can answer. Uh, sir, there are a few questions. Uh, do you okay. want to? So, yeah. So, okay. Why don't you tell me? Sure. So, uh, this one is from Vedika. She asks Rent does not imply ownership of land, but accessibility to it. Why is accessibility to land not enough? Uh, I don't know what uh, she means by accessibility to land. Mm. Uh, I think she would want to uh, mean that being able to use it for individual purposes. So even if they don't own land, they're able to uh, use it. For Access design. it, but then they would have to lease it. They would have to rent it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so if, if, if very few people own the land, uh, you know, let's say they are effectively landlords, they are going to lease the land, that's for sure. But then you have to look at what the rents are going to be like. 
and the rents will depend on the extent to which the market for leasing is monopolized and so if you have very high ownership inequality the market for tenancy would become monopolized and rents would become very high so you may have access but the access would be at a very high rent right uh, the next question is on an average farmers in india own about 1.15 hectares of farmland farmland holding has continued to decrease over the years how can we ensure that farmers have enough land to live a decent life this is by arunim yeah i guess uh, yeah so i i think i will I, i mean that is roughly what my talk is about so i i think you know uh, i hope to be able to address some of this uh, you know by the end of the lecture right okay um and another question is by mayank he asks what are your thoughts on the land reforms in the southern states of india okay i'll speak more about land reforms yeah so that's kind of coming up uh, <clears throat> okay Great. so let me proceed yeah. uh, so second why why is land inequality so high or how do we explain variations in land inequality uh so one one cause is the historical legacy of colonial land systems uh so the british uh, established three different kinds of land systems during the 18th and the and the 19th century the zamindari the rayatwari and the mahalwari and banerjee and ayers uh, aer paper 2005 uh showed that landlord based systems were associated with higher land inequality in the late 19th as well as the mid 20th century so the impact of the land settlement system uh, lasted uh, and probably still has uh, continues to to persist and i'm sorry uh, and they, they they also show that high the, the colonial land system is also correlated with measures of post independence economic development so this is part of the argument i was making at the very outset inequality uh, also has a functional impact on uh, on the level of economic development so uh, areas which were more unequal uh, in british times uh, achieved lower agricultural yields lower irrigation lower levels of fertilizer use <clears throat> okay so here is a a map of uh uh colonial india and the the different kinds of land systems the, the landlord system which is the sort of the plus sign was mainly uh you see bengal <coughs> uh urissa bihar uh stretching down the coast uh, and uh you see awadh and then you see the central provinces the rayatwari system the individual based system is prevalent mainly in in maharashtra bombay and uh, madras presidency and mysore <coughs> and uh, punjab and the north uh, northwest uh, uh, province uh, is based on the village based system so the main difference is between the landlord system and the non landlord systems that's what they focus on <coughs> and uh, this is a plot of the non landlord proportion so from 0 to 1 so bombay for instance you know there was almost no zamindari uh, uh whereas when you look at our or the central provinces it's more than 75% was zamindari and this is correlated with land inequality measured in 1885 okay so the more you have the landlord based system the higher the inequality the same pattern you see within uttar pradesh if you look across districts in uttar pradesh where you see this variation in uh, the proportion of the landlord system and you look at the land uh, inequality measured by the gini coefficient in the in 1948 okay and you see the same correlation so again so our for instance is represented here very high landlord proportion and also high land inequality as you know in even in up there are huge variation between western up which is much more equal compared to eastern up which is more like bihar <clears throat> this is the evidence on how the landlord based uh, districts vary from the non landlord based districts in various measures of agricultural development 100 years later 
or stretching all the way up till uh, the mid 1980s. Uh, the square, uh, the squares represent the non-landlord districts, the circles, the landlord districts. You see the significantly higher level of irrigation, of fertilizer usage, of uh, yields, agricultural yields, uh, and this is uh, all India. These three, and then even if you look within states and you at a more granular level across different districts, let's say of Tamil Nadu. You also see that rice yields are higher in the in the non-landlord district. So that's that's one reason for high inequality is the colonial legacy. The second reason is uh, the role of demographics. So this is often uh, commonly overlooked. <clears throat> Population growth and limited opportunities for urban jobs puts uh, creates a, a, a high population pressure on land in villages, which lowers land available per capita. And uh, this causes households to split. It causes disputes within households uh, and households tend to split. There is also sort of increased free riding in terms of shared agricultural operations. So for all these reasons, households tend to split. And the splitting of households causes land per household to go down. And so what happens is that households that own the moderate amount of land see the amount of land that they own going down. Uh, and eventually the small landowners own too little land. The size of the farm becomes too small to be viable. So then it makes sense for them to sell it off in times of distress. And then they become landless. So uh, the research I've done on the dynamics of land inequality in West Bengal provides detailed evidence for each of these assertions. And the process was aggravated by immigration into West Bengal uh, from Bangladesh after the 1971 war. So now, uh, on the other hand, what about the role of land reforms? Uh, from the 19, after independence, land reforms were an important policy goal of the Indian government. Uh, and there were two sets of reforms. One was imposition of land ceilings uh, and the appropriated land from those who held surplus land uh, was meant to be distributed to the landless. And second, uh, met, uh, protection of tenants. <clears throat> However, only a few states achieved significant or even modest land reforms uh, between 1960 and 2000. And these were Jammu and Kashmir and West Bengal. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir, if you look at the amount of land that was actually distributed, uh, was uh, more than 10% of land. Uh, and West Bengal was about 7% of land. But all the other states in India achieved 2% uh, or less. <clears throat> now, apart from the direct effect of these land reforms in reducing land inequality, uh, there were also important indirect effects because households that owned very large amounts of land uh, sold off the excess or they split. <clears throat> so both the direct and the indirect effects caused land inequality to fall to some extent, but not by much. And the, the work I did in West Bengal showed that, uh, let's say there was a 4% reduction uh, in land inequality. Uh, uh, but the effect of the land reform was overwhelmed by demographic factors, the, the factors that I uh, explained uh, a little while ago, uh, which, which raised inequality. So overall inequality tended to go up. <clears throat> so here is a figure from my paper, uh, again, looking at land inequality in West Bengal by cause between 1968 and 2004. And uh, what you see in the dark line is the role of the demographic factor the uh, uh, the combination of mainly the, the division of households, the splitting of households. <clears throat> and uh, the role of the land market. So quite often households that are small in times of distress, they sell off their land. <clears throat> and it's the large landowners who buy up the land at that time. Or you may, uh, in order to settle a debt, you, you sell your land and then your, the money lender takes over your land. <clears throat> So the market also tended to increase 
land inequality. That's the this dotted line. Uh, and the the role of land reform also in this uh, these calculations uh, land reform this is just the direct effect of land reform uh, it actually increased inequality <clears throat> but then we show that when we incorporate the indirect effects uh, if you look at the detailed analysis in our paper uh, the, the when you aggregate the direct and the indirect effects it reduced inequality slightly Now that's West Bengal. What about other Indian states? Uh, so I, I mentioned this number. Uh, this is from uh, the Land Commissioner of India was uh, P. S. Appu in, in Indira Gandhi's time, and he wrote this book on land reforms in India and collected data from all the Indian states. So according to his estimates, only 1.2 percent of operational land had been distributed across major 18 major states by 1992. The high achievers were Jammu and Kashmir, 18 percent; West Bengal, 7 percent; and Assam, 6 percent. <coughs> The low achievers, less than 1%, Gujarat, Himachal, Karnatak, MP, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, and UP. And moreover, the quality of redistributed land tended to be very poor. So the question, why was there so little effective land reform? <clears throat> now, the first, uh, first reason is uh, the legal obstacles to implementing land reform. Owners of large land holdings litigated and engaged in many legal subterfuges, Benami transfers, and so on. And even if they did give up some land to the government, they transferred the, the, the lowest quality of land. <clears throat> Second, uh, the poor state of land records in India, because uh, records are on a plot by plot basis, it makes it very hard for the government to identify household ownership. Who, how much does a particular household own? The government doesn't have doesn't have that information. And part of the problem is that the land records in India have not been updated. The cadastral survey last one was done in 1940 by the British authorities. Independent India has never had a cadastral land survey. <clears throat> and this has made it difficult for the government to identify who is landless. So even if the government has land to distribute, it doesn't know who to give it to. <clears throat> and perhaps, now apart from all these logistical and institutional problems, perhaps the most important roadblock is that landed elites wielded enough political influence to prevent any serious implementation of laws. And there's been, uh, I've done some work on this, a lot of other people showing the importance of political will. Uh, so for instance, just to give you some examples, the states which did implement land reform tended to have rather exceptional circumstances. So Jammu and Kashmir, most of it happened between 1950 and 1954 under Sheikh Abdullah, who was committed to counter the power of Prince Hari Singh. <clears throat> West Bengal, the left front came to power in 1977, following the Naxalite uprising, which was mainly, again, land related. <clears throat> and they had a strong ideological commitment to land reform. West Bengal, apart from distributing land and implementing land ceilings, also implemented tenancy protection laws. So this was there was a question about tenancy earlier. And uh, this is the other problem with tenancy. If land, if tenants are not secure in their ability to stay in the property, uh, uh, then again, it you know generates high inequality and low incentives for them to invest in the land. Uh, and so uh, the tenancy protection law is meant to provide uh, tenants security from eviction by the landlords. <clears throat> and the West Bengal government registered sharecroppers amounting to about 6% of all households and 11% of land by 1998, what was Operation Barga. <clears throat> and uh, studies that I and others have done have shown that these raised agricultural productivity, particularly Operation Barga, raised agricultural productivity and raised investment in private irrigation. <clears throat> and this was complemented by the distribution of subsidized seeds, fertilizers, credit, and medium irrigation by panchayats. West Bengal therefore achieved one of the highest rates of agricultural productivity growth amongst all Indian states between exactly the period when the land reforms were implemented. And yet other states did not emulate these reforms. I have talked to the land commissioner at the time, Devu Bandhavadhyay. Apparently, he was called by chief ministers of many other Indian states who wanted to know about the West Bengal experience. They heard about it. 
they said, we'll think about whether we will adopt something like this in our state. Two or three days later, they would come back and say, sorry, there is no political will to implement anything like this because of the power of the political power of the landowners lobby. And most of these states, as you know, at <clears throat> that time were controlled by the Congress. The, the base of the Congress was large landowners. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, I, I don't expect much from land reform in the future, either in West Bengal or elsewhere. Even in West Bengal, land reform stagnated after 1990. Devu Bondapadha and a lot of others argued that Operation Bargar should be completed. Those tenants should be given ownership of land. But even the CPM desisted from that. <clears throat> Very large landowning households have largely disappeared for demographic and other natural reasons. So there isn't, there aren't that many households who own land above the ceiling anyway. And there has been a very dramatic reduction in the proportion of land in India under tenancy. <clears throat> uh, so therefore, most farms are already owner cultivated or owner managed. So there isn't much scope for uh, for the reduction in inequality, but through either uh, uh, implementation of land ceilings or uh, uh, or tenancy protection. So where is where is the, the the nub of of inequality in the countryside? It's still a big difference between the landless and the marginal uh, landowners on the one hand, those owning less than uh, not even one hectare, I'd say half a hectare, and other medium uh, landowners who own between one to five hectares. So the problem is mainly one of low income and high vulnerability of landless workers and marginal landowners who constitute the vast majority of, of uh, Indian rural households today. So this is the final uh, uh, subtopic, as I mentioned. So what can be done as we face the future? What we really think about are steps that would boost smallholder agriculture and also the welfares of landless people. So here are a couple of policy recommendations that I have made and other people, uh, other economists have made on the basis of a fair bit of research. Land reform is not where the action is going to be. The action is going to be on credit, on finance, access to financial services, and it's going to be in reform of agricultural marketing laws. <clears throat> so first, microcredit and rainfall insurance uh, for small farmers and landless workers. It, Despite all efforts to, to, uh, to upgrade the financial system in India, the extension of credit and services to the poor still remains very backward. <clears throat> and most of formal bank credit still flows to medium and large farmers. Agricultural marketing reforms. Most small farmers are at the mercy of middlemen. <clears throat> Mandis are controlled by large farmers colluding with one another and with government agents in implementing APMC laws and state grain procurement. <clears throat> so we see all this protest by the farmers uh, with uh, the, the current government's efforts to dismantle the APMCs. Uh, keep in mind that most of those people who are protesting are large farmers. They are not representing the interests of small farmers. Large farmers are very well organized, particularly in Punjab and Haryana and Western UP. Small farmers, there's so many of them and they are not very well organized. And the interests of large farmers and small farmers are quite often diametrically opposed to one another. <clears throat> Investments in rural infrastructure. Throughout India now, we are facing problems with soil erosion and uh, <coughs> uh, deforestation and lowering of the water table. Uh, there are projections that uh, Punjab will turn into a desert 20 or 30 years down the road. <clears throat> so we need watershed development to restore groundwater and irrigation and prevent soil erosion. And I think the livelihoods of some of the most marginal people in India, I'm working now on some projects in Jharkhand, 
uh, where it is staggering to see the extent of malnutrition amongst tribal populations, and that is related to soil erosion. <clears throat> and related to that, forests are shrinking. Common lands, pastures are shrinking. This is what the poorest of the poor rely on. And why are they shrinking? There's encroachment by large farmers as well as by commercial interests, mining companies. You see the central belt of India uh, where I think these problems are most acute. You have huge expansion in mining. Uh, so again, Jharkhand or <coughs> Chhattisgarh. Other relevant policies, I know you've discussed land acquisition uh, for industry. There's been a steady increase in demand of agricultural land from industries, mining companies, and real estate developers to acquire agricultural land. <clears throat> the Land Reform Acts of 2011. Uh, now, of course, states are free to implement as they wish, and there is huge variation across states in actual practice. <clears throat> Education and urban migration, levels of permanent rural urban migration in India are very low by international standards. <clears throat> in the long run, the only solution is that the population pressure in agricultural areas has to diminish. And the only way that can happen, apart from the slowing growth rate of population, which is already happening, is for people to move to urban occupations and urban areas. So this structural transformation which has happened in most other parts of Asia even, is yet to really get going in India. And there is an urgent need to promote education and skill formation in rural areas, along with growth in urban employment opportunities. So the dismal state of public school and public health facilities in rural India is, is very important in the long <laughs> And finally, the only way that the government can truly help the truly poor is through some kind of an income protection program, which is going to be near universal. And so I applaud efforts, the government to try and implement through direct bank transfers to individuals and households throughout the country, some kind of income support. So proposals of something like a universal basic income have been discussed in recent years. I think we need to carry on the discussion. They needn't be universal, but uh, there's no reason why the richest 30% of the country should receive uh, income support from the government. But there are certainly ways of trying to implement a broad-based system of minimum income support for everybody in the country. And those are just going to be uh, much more efficient as well to implement uh, compared to various specific subsidy programs that we have in place, the LPG subsidy and the kerosene subsidy, which have adverse environmental consequences and actually do not reach the truly poor in rural areas. Okay, so let me stop here and uh, very much welcome questions. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful talk. Uh, the question that we have is, the first one would be, what would, sir, in your opinion, be one land reform that India could start off with? Well, I, it's okay. I, I've already mentioned the difficulties with, uh, with either tenancy protection or, or uh, implementation of land ceilings. I mean, there is scope for that. Uh, e even in that context, you know, one of the really surprising things I found in my research in many states in India, including West Bengal, there is a lot of land that has been collected by the government, you know, by implementing the ceilings. And that land is waiting to be distributed to the poor. And it has not yet been distributed to the poor. And it's very difficult to find out why. But I think there is some, it, there is some kind of corruption going on. I think incumbent governments use that land for their own purposes. They rent it out uh, to make incomes on the side. They use it as a, as a political tool uh, to, to woo votes. Uh, they rent it out to people on condition that they vote for the party in question. So there is various forms of corruption involved. Uh, again, it's a matter of political will. Uh, so that, 
I, I, I'm skeptical. I think there is scope for it to happen, but you know, I doubt that there will be the political will for it. The other kind of land reform that may still uh, be important is the consolidation of land. Uh, land holdings have become fragmented. Often any given household, even poor households I find, will own 10 or 11 different plots located in different parts of the village. Uh, so Western UP actually had a very successful land consolidation program in the 1980s, uh, where essentially the government comes in and tries to create a matching market. Uh, everybody wants, you know, it would make sense for people to sell their, you know, distant plots and, uh, and buy plots which are close to the, the, the main existing plots so that their plots would all be in a similar area. Uh, that kind of a consolidation program, I expect would not meet with the same kind of political resistance. Right. Uh, the next question is from Kushali. She asks, she, you said political factors are a major reason for the reforms not being implemented. What can we do from our side to ensure lesser land inequality? inequality? <laughs> Well, I mean, you can start a, you can try to start a movement, a political movement, you know, demanding action. Uh, and certainly in today's world, through social media and so on, we can all put pressure if we organize around particular themes. Uh, so I certainly encourage efforts to be engaged in, you know, in, in protests or in putting pressure on the government. Yeah, also in, in, our, in discussions that we have amongst each other in forums like this to raise awareness of the issue. Uh, and certainly we know that it is possible to put pressure on political powers by, uh, by common people getting organized. So that is exactly, I think, you know, my hope is that people will become aware of this and, and put some pressure on the government through, through civil action. Uh, and the other is, I guess, as you go forward in your life, you know, once you graduate, uh, the kind of careers that you select, uh, let's say you go into law, you know, what kind of lawyer do you want to be? Uh, what kind, you know, so you can, you can, uh, you could devote yourself to, you know, I mean, I think there is huge scope for legal help for the landless and poor people or tribal populations that are getting displaced. So. It can affect, you can make a difference by the kind of career that you choose and the kind of work that you want to do for the rest of your life. Right. Our last question for the day is from Kirti. How are conflicts resolved in the case of land distributions to the poor? Can political sway hinder the very distribution too? Sorry, what was the last, uh, last bit again? Can you repeat it? Can political hindrance itself affect the distribution of land? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, try to argue that the, the primary factor, you know, in land disputes is political. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's politics combined with, you know, with, in, with economic inequality. It's political parties, you know, are beholden to people to, to people or companies that contribute large sums of money to their election campaigns. Uh, so it's kind of a coalition between the wealthy and the politically powerful. Uh, we see this all over the world. It's not just in India. Okay, this, this phenomenon, you know, in, in the United States, I think largely what we are seeing over the last 30 years is a result of huge amounts of deregulation uh, and uh, uh, is essentially the capture of government by special interests. You know, the top 1% of the population has enormous control of the, over the government through its ability to contribute to political campaigns. Uh, and, and, you know, winning elections is more and more a matter of, of money power. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, it's worldwide. So, uh, you know, so this, this is the, the sad fact of our times uh, that makes it very difficult to control inequality. 
and economic inequality and inequality of political power therefore go hand in hand and i think the common population you know the common 99% of the population is left out you know both in terms of economics and in terms of political power and the only hope is to be aware to be organized uh and you know resolve in each of our individual lives to try and make a difference right uh so would you be willing to take one last question since we have a oh absolutely minutes? yes uh -huh. okay so this one is from our professor ms teya thayal she asks there are studies showing an inverse relationship between the computerization of public services in indian states and corruption is there likely to be a relationship between such digitization and land inequality uh yeah well it depends on what kind of digitization uh so with land records for instance you know this is another i think urgent reform that could be undertaken in india which is to improve and update the land records what the government has been doing what various state governments have been doing is try to computerize land records but what they do is they work off you know they computerize again the plots the plot by plot records and that's useless you know when it comes to land inequality so uh, that's problem number 1 and problem number 2 again you are institutionalizing or digitizing useless data it's based on the 1940 cadastral land survey so uh, the government you know quite often something that was not irrigated in 1940 is now irrigated you know in the last uh, eight, 80 years or so somebody may have decided to irrigate their land now if the government is going on the basis of the 1940 land record it doesn't know that so when you let's say when you decide what is the appropriate compensation when the government is acquiring your land let's say for an in, industrial project the appropriate compensation depends on whether or not your land is irrigated and so quite often large part of the disputes are happening because you think you are entitled to compensation or for irrigated land but the government thinks your land is unirrigated and it, so it gives you the compensation for unirrigated land so there was research i did on uh, the singur debacle in west bengal on land acquisition and this was the primary problem again the land records were totally outdated so i think there is huge scope to update land records but we have to get it right you know the land record has to be land at the household level incorporating the value of land the value of land based on the current status of the land not the 1940 status so i think there is scope for upgrading the land records fundamentally uh, and also collecting data at the household level and then digitize it that makes sense okay so this kind of half hearted digitization is neither here nor there right thank you so much sir uh, for this stimulating talk and for answering our enthusiastic audience given the importance of land availability and accessibility today your comments are indeed timely in the midst of such a traditionally debated topic thank you once thank you <clears throat> With this, we are now all set for the most eagerly awaited segment. After bustling three days of competitive involvement in economics, literature, finance, politics, and management events, I now request Chairperson Kaching, Mr. Prithvi Dirwani, to announce the winners. In case the teams wish to cheer for the winners, please feel free to fire up the live chat or use the emojis towards the bottom of your screen. Prithvi, over to you. like the vijay said we've all been waiting for this so let's get started we'll start with the events first uh for worth words uh at position 2 we have shiv kakkar from third 3 and at number 1 we have sondarya rajgopal from c004 now moving on to the joker At number two, we have Shreya Chhabra, C zero four zero.
Sorry, just give us a minute. Uh, we are fixing some network problems. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, uh, I'll repeat for uh, pitch, please. At second place, we have Pragya and Vanshika Santani from Thanos 3. And at first place, we have Vayu Bansali and Aryan Sangvi from Thanos 2. For Kaching 9-9, at second place, we have Twisha Kedia from Peggy Carter 3 and Manat Chima from C054. Somehow I manage, at number, at number two, we have Mohit Divan. And at number one, we have Anandini Tanwar from Iron Man 2. Rajneeti, at number two, we have Ahan Kapileshwari and Devangi Joshi from Valkyrie 1. And Vedanch Agarwal and Vasu Sahi from Doctor Strange 2. For Inquisitive, we have Rohak Shah and Vedant Gada. And at, at number two, and at, no, at number one, we have Adit Nair and Avinash Tripathi from Nightcrawler 2. Upstart, we have Yashasvi Peta and Pentapati Shiva Krishna from C019 at number 2. And at first for first place, we have Vasu Bhartia and Riddhi Jain from Wolverine 1. Meme Lord, at number 2, we have Gitika Nek from Loki 3 and Madhav Mehta from C027. Bull Run, at number two, we have Anuj Khandelwal and Akshit Singh from Dr. and Jayesh Rungta and Yash Agarwal from C033. Follow the buzz, we have Simran Ramsey and Devika Kanse from C011 for at number two. And first place is Yosha Khurana and Danish Malhotra from Valkyrie 2. And for Moneyball, second place is Yashodan Nakhare from C010 and Ishan Gandhi from Thanos 2 at number at first place. Tradenomics, Akanksha Patodia and Gautam Sodani from Doctor Strange at second place and Bhumika Kukreja and Ish Ishita Jawalkar from C029 at first place. For Arbitrator, we have Keshav Maheshwari from C018 at second place and Ketan Jain, Doctor Strange at first place. And last but not the least, for War of Westeros, we have Divyam Sureka from Thor 2 at second place and Unati Jain, Javis 2 at first place. Thank you, Prithvi. I now request President Edgecon, Ms. Anunita Jena, to give a brief overview of Edgecon 2021. Thank you, Divija. As part of our conclave, in collaboration with renowned policy think tanks of our country, grassroots research and advocacy movement, and Center for Public Policy Research, the second edition of our National Policy Challenge was also conducted. The challenge focused on income inequality and the different facets of economic and social life impacted by it. It began on 12th January and ended on 30th January 2021. After a rigorous screening of policy reports and immense efforts put in by our participants and 15 plus academicians, policy experts and professors, we are proud to announce the results of the challenge. I would now kindly request Professor Dilip Mukherjee to announce the winners. So could you kindly unmute yourself? Yeah, sorry. Okay. All right. I'm very pleased to announce first the runners up uh, Team Damani, whose members are Dilan Kacheria, Priyanshu Srivastava, and Marshall Mera. Applause, 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 applause. Okay. <laughs> and finally, Thanks. the winner of Policy Challenge 2021, Team Adani. 
whose members are Priyesh Mutha and Tarushi Dube. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Anunita. On behalf of the NMIMS Sarla Anil Modi School of Economics and the entire team of EDGECON and Kachi, we would like to wholeheartedly thank all the participants and our audience for joining us today. Our last but not the least award would be handed over to by Anunita. And and for the last two things, first, CL was um, the college that is one is Thor, that is NM College. The CL is Josh Partney. ACL one is Divyam Sureka, and ACL two is Shiv Rajdan. <laughs> and finally, for the Kaching Trophy, we have at number at uh, place number one, Doctor Strange, which is. Sarla Anil Modi School of Economics. <laughs> but being the host college, obviously we're not going to be taking this trophy. So I'm going to start with number two in the Kaching Trophy, which is Thor, NM College once again, the CL, Josh Partney, ACL1, Divyam Sureka, and ACL2, Shiv Rasdan. And at number one, we have Valkyrie. HR College of Commerce and Economics, the CL Namita Prabhu, ACL Divyangi Joshi, and Saurav Modi Ramani. Okay, thank you, Gurdjian. Thank you, Krithvi. Now, with this, we finally conclude EdgeCon and Kachin 2021. We hope to see you next year, hopefully offline. Thank you. I would now like to call upon our president Edgecon, Ms. Anunita Jena, to kindly give the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Dilip Mukherjee, Organizing Committee, and our lovely audience. It is an honor for me to have the opportunity to give a vote of thanks on this special day. I extend my thanks to our Honorable Chief Guest for having taken time out from his busy schedule and gracing the event. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your words today. It was a pleasure learning from you. I would also extend my gratitude to our gifting partner, Cinnamon Sticks, housing partner, Youthwill, platform partner, Airmeet, stationery partner, Camlin, technology and services partner, Finlatics, health and wellness partner, Luxurious Lago, electronics partner, OPPO, and finally, our education consultancy partner, Foreign Admits. Lastly, I must not forget to th thank the organizing team and volunteers for working hard these last few days to make the fest a huge success. <laughs>